God's grace, mercy, and peace be unto you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're entering into uh, Sundays where the Scripture lessons point us to Jesus coming again and events that happen uh, near that time. And so we're going to talk about a few things, but we're queuing in on Daniel chapter 12. And uh, just to kind of focus us on what the message is, uh, I was uh, reading and found that uh, they were doing a, a reverberation of the uh, Washington Monument in Washington, D.C. in the early 1990s. And I want you to know, uh, that's where I grew up. And so way back when, when you used to visit, you used to be able to walk up the steps and walk down and see all the different things on the side, the plaques and the monuments and things like that to the various people who had either donated or there was a message to the nation from different countries. It was really neat. Except, you know, guys, my current age apparently walked up and had heart attacks. So the rules changed. You could go up in the elevator and walk down. But apparently guys like me walked down and had heart attacks. So now you can only go up the elevator and down the elevator. So you're missing quite a bit. But here's what happened in the early 90s. In this uh, reconstruction of the lobby, they took down the pieces of marble. And those pieces of marble on the wall were put up around 1900. And here's what they discovered underneath. Graffiti. Yeah, you thought that was a modern thing, didn't you? Graffiti from the late 1800s. Although the message is slightly different, let me read to you what was painted on the wall. Whoever is the human instrument under God in the conversion of one soul erects a monument to his own memory more lofty and enduing than this one. Seen a message like that around Saginaw? In fact, it's kind of complicated, right? I got to read it again. Whoever is the human instrument under God in the conversion of one soul erects a monument to his own memory more lofty and enduing than this one. Jan Eggers walked out the last service and she said, I was having trouble track and I needed it a third time. So, whoever is the human instrument under God in the conversion of one soul erects a monument to his own memory more lofty and enduing than this one. It's great having some graffiti that actually uh, tells us a little bit about our reading scripture of the day, of the week. And if you would, this is the time. Is it already up there? Good. Let's go to verses 1 and 2, I think, are on the first slide. We're going to take a look at this to kind of help us here understand what's going on. And so we're going to start at that time. That's it. Here's what you need to know about at that time. Daniel 10 and 11 talk about at that time. And I'm going to summarize at that time for you in a few words. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't go read it for yourself. Here's what I'm saying. Daniel 10 and 11, before Jesus comes again, it says there, it's going to be really, really, really bad. How's that for a summary? Then it says, at that time, okay, when things get really, really bad, it's almost time for Jesus to come. Remember that Michael, the great prince who protects your people will arise. And then again, pointing us back, there will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Now, don't go on yet, guys. Will be delivered. Do you get that? This book, other places, is called the book of life. And here's how your name gets written into the book of life. Now, I'm, I'm pulling from the various places that talk about this, but in summary, your name is put into the book of life. 
If you have responded to the Holy Spirit and declared Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that you believe that He went to the cross for you, that He died there, shed His blood for your forgiveness, rose again and declared victory for all of us. Those people are written in the book of life. And then the promise at the bottom there, the very bottom is, we will be delivered. Our salvation is secure in Him. All right, next verse. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to, after, to everlasting life and others to shame and everlasting contempt. All right, so there it is again. We talked about this last week. Some go up, everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Two destinations. And the priority is being given to us here about things that last. Things that shine like the stars forever and ever. Here it is, verse 3. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. We want to create, don't we? I mean, you think about this every now and then, a legacy. When you die, hopefully people will remember you. You kind of want to know that, right? Well, uh, God is telling us here the only thing that's really important that has any lasting effect is sharing the love of Jesus Christ and having more people go to heaven. Just like our graffiti from the 1800s, whoever is the human instru instrument under God in the conversion of one's soul. Just one. Now, we talked about this before. I know this. In fact, I'd like to invite you, if you would like a plan of what to say when you're talking to somebody about Jesus. We went through this a few weeks ago. It's in the Faith or Fear series called Bold to Tell. And here it's really cool. You just go to the website, you click on Messages, and then it comes up. And then you go down on the right-hand column, uh, down to f um, Faith or Fear, Bold to Tell. You click on that one, and in that message, it gives that instruction. So I'm not going over that again today, all right? But I do want to share with you the excuses I've heard are kind of covered in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I've had people tell me they don't know enough Bible. I've had people tell me that uh, they just don't have the ability to share Jesus with anybody. So here it is. In chapter 1, it says, God makes use of the weak things, the foolish things, the lowly things, the despised things, and things that are not for His glory and for His purpose. Did you find yourself in the list? Let me read the list again. God makes use of the weak things, the foolish things, the lowly things, the despised things, and the things which are not according to uh, His purpose and glory. Here's what that means. What God is looking for is volunteers. No skill necessary. No ability necessary. Volunteers willing to speak for Him about the love of Jesus Christ. Before the time comes that people are determined to go to everlasting life or shame, God wants us in the midst of all the trying and troubling times, He wants us to share Jesus and His love. In chapter 11, it tells us the same thing. In the midst of all the really, really, really bad stuff happening, okay, it says there, those who are wise will instruct many. Those who know about God will instruct many. That's the same thing that's in our verse here, verse 3, where it says in the Hebrew, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. It's that wise is also like those who are willing to teach others. Those who are willing to speak up. Then in verse 11, 35, it does say this. Near the end, some of the wise will stumble, but it's so they can be refined and purified and made spiritual. Botless until the time of the end. 
Paul tells us about that, that our faith is like gold. Every time we stumble, every time we experience trial or trouble, God is using that, wants to use that to refine our faith, making it to be like pure gold. So I want to encourage you by sharing a few examples from the Bible about people who were not or did not have the ability, apparently, to do the job they were given. First one is Moses. Moses in the Bible. He's the one that went and spoke to the Pharaoh and brought the Israelites out of Egypt. He stuttered. Can you imagine that, being a stutterer and being asked to speak in front of multitudes? And God used him. God used him. And what about Elisha? Elisha, okay, and Elijah. So I'm going to really emphasize that. Uh, to explain the difference, and I'm, re I'm really going to emphasize those two names so you understand who we're talking about through this story, because, you know, I can't even get my kids straight when they're on the same room, all right? So, Elijah is the famous prophet, the one who was most of his life, <laughs> at times he was pursued, they wanted to kill him, but he was known as courageous for the Lord, the prophet. And... They knew he was nearing the end of his life. And so who would take over? Well, if you read about it, there were a whole bunch of prophets following him around, hoping to get the anointing. The Bible tells us about 50. Can you imagine following Elijah around, you know, hoping to be the one and all the jockeying for position, all the church politics happening, and all, you know, boy, it's going to be me. You know, I've been preaching for 30 years. You know, it's going to be me. And so they're all jockeying for this position where Elijah knows Eli Shah is the one. And Elisha is told that if he can manage to be with Elijah at the end, he will be blessed and he'll be given a double portion of Elijah's ministry. That is, Elisha will be able to affect and meet the needs of of twice as many as the Elijah ever could. And so, you read along in the story, Elijah takes off his prayer shawl, slaps the Jordan, it parts, and the two of them walk across, and they get some distance between them and those others that are jockeying, the ones who are seminary trained, the ones who are qualified And Elijah, as he's taken to heaven, throws his prayer shawl in blessing to Elisha. Elisha was a farmer. Didn't have any of the qualifications of anybody else. And God chose him. Then I think about Paul, who declares himself to be the worst of sinners. And he shares that with us so that we will be reminded that, you know, his sin was so bad and God could love him and be patient and forgive him and use him in a great way. He can also do that with us and for us. God can use, or God makes use, of the weak things, the foolish things, the lowly things, the despised things, and the things which are not. And for that purpose of His glory and the sharing of His love. And we're told in Daniel chapter 11 and Daniel chapter 12 that between now and the time Jesus comes, we are to be sharing the love of Jesus Christ. So I thought I'd share with you this morning three different true scenarios of how people shared Jesus. 
and you might see yourself in one of them. Do you remember in the early 90s, there was this plane that was hijacked, Ethiopian Airlines, and they flew around and they finally ran out of gas and they crashed into the ocean? I did not know. It's near the Comoro Islands that that happened. And apparently I was going to look for it online, but I forgot. But apparently they even have videotape of this plane going down. Andrew Meekins died in the crash, but a survivor shared his story. See, in the midst of this plane going down, Andrew stood up and shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's a good thing it was him, because if it was me, I'd be turning to the cockpit going, I need a little more time, I'm not done with this sermon yet. But Andrew was able to share it quickly. As the plane's going down, he stands up, he shares what Jesus Christ has done, and he calls everybody on the plane to profess Jesus Christ as Savior. Twenty new Christians profess Jesus before they hit the water. Imagine that, huh? Before that moment. Another one, I was reading a sermon by Dwight Moody of the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. He shares this story. He met a pastor in London who shared this one, all right? This pastor always used the same route to get to church. And as he's walking along one morning, he looks over the house, and in the front window is a toddler, and he smiled at him, and the toddler smiled back. Day after day, smiles at him, toddler smiles back. So finally, he smiles and waves. Toddler smiles and waves back. A few days later, There's three children in the window. He walks by, smiles and waves. They all smile and wave back. A few days after that, there's five kids in the window. And they're waiting for him. And he walks by, he smiles and waves, and they smile and wave back. Week later, it's five kids and their parents standing in the window waiting for him to walk by. He smiles and waves. They all smile and wave back. A few days of this going on, and the parents are curious about this guy. They want to know what he does. So they dress the two oldest kids to be ready to go. And he walks by. He smiles and waves. They all smile and wave back. Then they send the two kids out the front door to follow him. They end up in church. And they come back and report to their parents. He's a pastor. And he shared with us the love of Jesus during the service. you got to come with us next week. Wow, huh? What about Doug Nichols? Doug Nichols writes this account. This is in the late 1960s. He just is motivated to share Jesus, so he goes to India. And he's trying to do things for Jesus, but he has no idea of the language. And he gets tuberculosis. And back then, do you guys remember this? I mean, when people would get sick with that disease, they'd put them all together. They call it a TB sanitarium. So all the sick people are in one spot. So everybody with TB is gathered together, and they have nurses and things trying to care for them. But that's so they could kind of try to contain the illness. So he gets put there. Can you imagine that, being so sick and put into a place and nobody knows your language and you don't know theirs? He tries to hand out pamphlets, but nobody will talk to him. One morning, about 2 a.m., he's waking up coughing, and the guy, the older man in the bed next to him is trying to get out of bed, but he doesn't know quite what he, you know, why he's trying to do that, what's going on. And by morning they know, because the entire ward smells, okay? They come to clean him up, and they're very nasty with him about his accident. In fact, Doug says that one of the nurses even slapped him. Next night, about 2 a.m., he wakes up coughing, realizes that man in the next bed is trying to get out of bed again. 
And he thinks, I have more strength than he does. So he gets out of his own bed, goes over, puts his arm under his head and an arm under the legs and carries him to the bathroom and holds him up while he does his thing. Gently carries him back and places him into bed. And with the language barrier, the guy tries his best to say thank you. And they both go to sleep. 4 a.m., they shake Doug. There's like eight people around his bed. And they're like really happy about it and trying to thank him for taking the guy to the toilet. And so he reaches down, grabs some pamphlets, and starts handing them out. And they're like, yeah, thanks. 6 a.m., another group around his bed shaking him awake. Not much sleep, but it was okay with him because he was like handing out more pamphlets. All day long, he hands out stuff to everybody. And within a few days, people are coming to him, even with the language barrier, and sharing the fact that they've given their lives to Jesus Christ. Think about it. We have three of them. We have opportunities in a crisis, a smile, and a toilet. God can use the little things, the weak things, for His purpose and His glory. During the reign of Oliver Cromwell, now, if you don't know who that is, you have to look at the history of Great Britain and go to Wikipedia. But let me just share. They were out of money. The government was out of money. All right? So he sends out a group to try to find some silver. The group comes back after a month, and they say to Oliver Cromwell that they couldn't find any silver anywhere except in the cathedrals where the statues of the saints were made out of the choicest of silver. And his response to them was, let's melt down the saints and put them into circulation. Now, I know this is a loose comparison, but as we wait for Jesus Christ, you're not supposed to be a statue in church. The call is to circulate. And look for opportunity, even in the smallest of things, because God can use the worst of sinners, the weakest, the lowliest, the most despised, and even those which are not meaning, ability, or whatever you think of yourself. God can use the worst of us to carry His message of love to others. And as we approach the end of times, it becomes critical. Critical. And we're told, I mean, it's point blank. It's point blank in Daniel 11 and Daniel 12 that before Jesus comes, we are to be occupied. We are to share that message of love with others, that they would be receive the call. And as going back to that graffiti on the wall, to be the human instrument under God. See, God's not looking for the qualified. God's looking for volunteers to respond to His love by sharing His love with others. May God grant us His favor and blessing as we do that in our realm with our families, our friends, the people that God might draw us close enough to to smile. Amen. Now the peace of our God which passes all our understanding. Keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Amen.